Hello, Silver Squad, and welcome back to the damn sofa. That's the sofa behind me. This is my trusty little emotional sidekick, Mr. Roscoe. And my name's Paul, and we are definitely going to need Mr. Roscoe. He's not sitting on the sofa today, because what we're going to be talking about is just, this case is so out there, y'all. Uh, you, you saw the thumbnail, so you know we are going to be talking about the Chandler Halderson sentencing today. And a lot of people have been asking me, did you see the sentencing? Da -da -da. Now... The sentencing itself, like the part that I watch or whatever, it's like an hour long, a little bit over an hour. So I do implore you to watch it yourself because this video is probably going to be at least 30 minutes in itself. What I have done for this video is I've gone through and I clipped out like very certain parts of the sentencing that I want to make some commentary on that I felt like were good, you know, talking points and things of that nature. Uh, because I definitely have a lot of opinions and then definitely hearing some of the things they discussed in the sentencing with, with the judge, the state, the defense. I was like, oh, okay, you know what? I see this now or whatever, so on and so forth. Um, so there's that. I will say that there are some cases out there that stick out more than others uh, and the way that they maybe, you know, touch me or speak to me or make me feel. Uh, and this was definitely one of them, right? This case is absolutely so senseless it's just jaw dropping and like so many of these things that we see cases in general but especially these ones and i'm thinking of you know grant amato uh jennifer pan who i'm doing a video on that one so be on the lookout for that soon um i could keep going or whatever but none of the others going to mind except at least the m mental images of them um anyways these senseless crimes like this, where these people do these horrifying acts against their family, it just, it blows my mind. And this one obviously being the most recent one, I mean, it's so disturbing. Um, and I also really, 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 really adored the judge in this case. This was one of the most well-run, I don't know if you've heard the word professional is the right word to use for it, but a well-run courtroom, this just felt like a very well-oiled machine going. And so that's it. So I want to talk about those aspects of it. So if you've been here before at the sofa, you know, what I'll do is I'll, I'll play some clips and then make some commentary on it, that kind of a thing. Um, and then that's it. So go ahead and buckle your damn sofa seatbelts up because we're going to need it. Oh. Almost every homicide I've prosecuted, there's been a fairly tragic backstory of the defendant. You, there's not an explanation here. Um, Chandler grew up with a life of privilege by pretty much, I think, any sort of angle you look at it. Okay, so that are, is one of the prosecutors talking. And just like she said, and this is one thing that I think just baffles so many of us with this case, is literally there's just nothing in his past that would warrant the reaction that he had over his own actions, right? Because remember, what this case is about is about Chandler wiping out his mother and father when they found out that his entire world was a pack of lies, right? And that was his reaction. We'll get more into that in a little bit, but I just felt like this was good starting out because they're talking about the PSI report and all this, and there's just, there's literally nothing that is usually there. So let's continue. Um, there's absolutely no ab evidence of abuse whatsoever. And just like she'll say there, where any kind of picture that might have been tried to paint it by him or anything like that, or even looking back at past cases, not just his or whatever, where you see some of these factors that you can kind of be like, I might not agree with what they did, but okay, I'm seeing how this added up. Like that is not there with this case. He had numerous people that would drop everything to help him if it was needed. Another thing that stuck out to me about this case is that just like she said, him, Mitchell, they, they had like this very big network of people, not only their parents, but their parents' friends, people like this. And we saw these people take the stand and whatnot. And I was just like, wow, they had all of these people around them. And again, we see where Mitchell turned out fine, right? But with Chandler, it's just like, how could he just ignore this support group that he has and go down this road of just pity self-pity and wallowing in his own doings until it resulted in something like this it just absolutely blows my mind the only potential criticism that anyone that we talked to and we talked to well over a hundred people um was that perhaps his mother babied him a little too much or was a little too doting now we would see that on the stand as well like mitchell would make a couple of references that you know his mom 
you know, would be a little bit concerned about their lives and stuff like that. But it was nothing that he was saying that triggered any kind of thing of like, oh, this is like some kind of crazy, like, we kept our kids captive and da da da. You know what I'm saying? I mean, literally, this is, could be any parent, right? Any parent. And again, it's just interesting to me to see how Mitchell turned out versus his brother. And to see how much investigating they did, like looking for something, right? Some reason. I think that's why this case bothers so many of us so much. It's because every rock that is unturned looking for any kind of clue is like, well, could this have caused it? There's just, there's nothing there. But I do think it's worth noting that in all of the jail calls and messages that the detectives and Mr. Brown and I um, listened to, there was never even a moment um, where Chandler mourned his parents' death. And that's another dynamic right there uh, with the lack of emotion from him. And he'll speak to this. We'll listen to what he had to say in a minute. But there was never any of that. Like, you would think, look at how traumatized so many people in the community and the family and all this were as to what he did to the parents. There is absolutely nothing there with him, void of anything. And even though he might say later on about, like, oh, I was told to do this, whatever, his actions speak louder than words, and she's the, the state's going to speak on that now. It was interesting. Um, in one message, somebody had told him that they just got back from his parents' memorial service, and they were sad. He suggested that they watch a slasher movie, Halloween. Okay, now, if y'all follow me, you know I am a horror film fan, so there are times where I can understand, like, oh, I get, com like, it's nostalgic for me to watch horror films. That being said, this just speaks to his lack of, you know, being able to take the, the room temperature, you know what I'm saying? And again, a scenario like this where it's like, I guess I look at it where I'm like, okay, not only did he do this to his parents, so at this point in time, People aren't even really aware or whatever 100% of what's taking place, regardless. Um, he knows what he did. And he's just like, oh, well, let's go watch Halloween. I mean, it just blows my mind. You would think there would have been some sign of recovering from trauma, something of this nature, and just absolutely not. Just kept on going on, completely oblivious to anything around him. Now, what we're getting ready to do now is we're going to listen to some of the excerpts from the victim impact statements. Uh, and the state is going to be reading these off. And so let's just hear what they have to say. Um, the first victim impact statement is submitted by CAN, um, who's the future daughter-in-law to Bart and Krista Halderson. I've lost my future mother and father-in-law in such a senseless and brutal way. This loss will remain with me for the rest of my life. Now, this is Mitchell's uh, fiance, and remember, if you watched the trial and seen Mitchell and her drive to the cab the lake house, I mean, the cab in the lake house, whatever you call it, um, can you imagine finding out that this is what has happened to your future mother and father-in-law? The people who she will say are so welcoming to her, making her feel so at home, welcoming into the family, and it's like, your brother-in-law does this. I can't wrap my mind around it. And this speaks again to how many victims are in this case. Not only, obviously, his parents, right? But the extended victims who have survived this and been witness to it. Bart and Krista were amazing people. They were there to help everyone and anyone with whatever they could. Krista had always been so welcoming to me. And again, this is coming from Mitchell's fiance. And, and just like I said, I mean, this dynamic of how people describe them person after person would get up on the stand and talk about this, right? Which just makes it even more senseless. And I just, I just, again, I can't imagine, like, even on their wedding day, what is that going to be like, right? I mean, just think of all these little moments in life moving forward that they are going to be reminded of the brutality of this crime and the loss of it. And one thing that gets me with this is anytime I think about it, my mind, you just can't help but go to the grisly nature of what he did to their bodies. And I just go to that where I'm like, I, I, I can't, I just, I cannot imagine. It would just seem so horrible if those were actually people you were related to, your parents who are friends or whatever. My heart just goes out to all these outlying victims. We are comforted in knowing that Chandler cannot physically hurt us. However, if he was given the opportunity for parole, I would be terrified for Mitchell and my family's safety. 
And again, this is one of the just absolutely true factors of this, you know, and we're keeping in mind, this is the sentencing. This is them speaking out. You know, he's going to get life like we know this, right? So it's just a matter of does he get life without parole or life with the option of parole? And this is so true. I mean, imagine if you were anyone related to these people, right? Um, Mitchell, her kids, whatever. And he got paroled. I mean, it would be scary, right, to know that this person is on the street, let alone anyone else. So, I mean, again, I feel for her. It would be something that I, I just would not feel comfortable. And also, if there was the option for parole, because Mitchell is young, right? What is he, 24 now? Imagine having to continually go to every parole hearing fighting that situation of, I want to make sure he stays behind bars, let alone what they're already going to have to be involved with court-wise and that kind of stuff. So, I mean, I, I get it. So now let's take a listen to what their, and why their, I mean, Mitchell and Chandler's grandmother had to say in regards to her wishes for Chandler. The second letter is from Kayleen Halderson, um, mother of Bart and Chandler's grandmother. Now, before we get into her words and whatnot, I do think that this is always an interesting intersection in these cases because, first of all, you think about this. This is his, you know, the grandparent, the grandmother. So, you know, he took out their child, right? Uh, but still showing love and compassion towards him. Let's make note that he did not offer his own parents, right? Uh, but I'm always interested in these true crime cases where this takes place because this has to be so stressful, so confusing for survivors of the victims when it's another family member because they have this established relationship with a family member. Clearly, she loves her grandson. Also, he did a very horrible thing. So it just, it, again, it puts them in this very terrible situation. These are my feelings about Chandler. He is my grandson. I love him even though what he did was horrific. I can't believe his parents would want him to be incarcerated for life. I'm hoping he will find a trade or a craft while, and, while there to become a productive and caring person. We hope the people in charge of that facility will feel someday he deserves a second chance in life with the possibility of parole. Chandler's grandma, Kayleen Halderson. I mean, if that's just not, I mean, my gosh, I mean, her saying, I'm sure the parents would not want him to be behind bars. And that just speaks to the kind of family that he came from, right? This like compassionate level that he just absolutely lacks. And again, I think psychologically, if you know my channel, I'm not a psychologist or any of that stuff. But so for me, just watching this psychologically, it's interesting because there's clearly something completely void in him, right? Um, and I don't even know the proper, I mean, obviously I don't know the diagnosis, right? But you know what I'm saying? Like, like even what it would begin to be that he completely lacks what his other family members clearly have right now the state will also go over a letter from krista's best friend who we also saw take the stand the title that was most important to krista was that of mom that was her identity being a mom was her purpose in life her best friend would go on to describe you know, how Krista kept, you know, the awards and stuff that he had done in school and things of this nature. And again, this is where I think we see where it's like she was like this super mom kind of a person. And uh, even her, I think her boss at work described her as the work mom. Like she always had, if you needed a Band-Aid, if you needed this or whatever, a, a sewing pen, so she had everything, right? She was your go-to person or whatever. She was just always prepared for whatever. Uh, and again, I just think, think that this speaks volumes as to the type of people that Krista and Bart were. Multiple people, when we talked to them about Bart and Krista, said, you know, if they would have found out about Chandler's lies and his deception, they would have been upset. They would have been. But they also would have worked with him to get him back on the right track. And herein lies a huge issue with this because it does seem like anybody knows when you've gotten in trouble as a young person or whatever that 
it, it's not fun having to fess up to that. It's not fun having angry parents. We all get that. And the judge as well as the next state prosecutor when he talks is going to touch on this. Um, but I think it's interesting that even friends and people like that knew, like, you know what? Yeah, they were going to get mad. I mean, who wouldn't? Like, who would not get mad over this, right? This is huge. I mean, if it hadn't ended in this way and he came clean to them, this would be like a level of probably we need to get you in therapy. Somebody willing to go to these lengths. And again, it, it so much reminds me of Jennifer Pam. I've been going over her case and I'm just like, it's so similar. Uh, to that. Hers was a little more plotted out, I think, and this is more grisly. Um, but regardless. So that's what's interesting is that he thought it was easier to do this than it was to take the, not even the high road, but the normal road. I mean, my God, right? Um, so anyways, let's, let's listen to what the other prosecutor has to say. That being said, as Miss Raymond said, almost always in a sentencing hearing uh, for a homicide or even lesser crimes, we have some understanding as players in the criminal justice system of the underlying causes of someone's problems, the root causes. Uh, frequently, it's substance abuse. Frequently, it's mental illness. Uh, frequently, it's uh, inability to control anger and, and other behavioral problems that have manifested themselves throughout someone's life. You, you probably are wondering, and I'll tell you, it's been thoroughly investigated of whether there were any red flags that anyone missed. Was Mr. Halderson um, engaged in bad behavior as a youth? Was he harming animals? Was he harming people? Um, none of that is true that we can tell. He seemed to be a pretty normal kid. See, this is the part that really gets me with this case is this aspect right here of there's absolutely nothing there, right? And even these things that he brings up of like the animal harming, things of this nature. Poor little Roscoe, he doesn't want to hear that. Um just all these telltale signs it's so bizarre how out of the blue this seemed to be right now another dynamic that i think is interesting here is the way they split up what they talked about amongst the state which i think that it was really excellent i really appreciated the state's case and how they presented it uh in this uh trial and i think that it was a really good choice to have her talk about more of the dynamic of the family and the mother and things of that nature. And he seems to be going into maybe some more technical stuff or whatever. I just think it was a good choice on what each of them are talking about because they each have a really good delivery and what they're doing. And I really felt like the way she delivered these like storytelling, if you will, of the story of Krista and Bart, of the people that knew them, what she was like as a mother, him as a father, things of that nature. Uh, she just has a really nice touch. Like, I like the way she talks, right? Um, and I like the male uh, state guy, too, as well. Um, so, anyways, I just thought that that was a good choice to make or whatever. Anyways, let's keep going. Next, the court has to consider the protection of the public. And here's where um, I think the court has to probably give a great weight to this factor. Mr. Halderson, by all accounts, chose to commit the crime of first-degree intentional homicide twice on a single day because he was caught lying about where he was working and going to school, or perhaps just where he was going to school. It was uncomfortable, probably, that he was caught. It probably wasn't an experience he was looking forward to in dealing with the repercussions of that. But those kind of inconveniences and uncomfortable situations are constantly present in life. This is one of those where I'm like, amen, mister, amen. And we touched on this a little bit ago. And this is what's so scary about this is that that was his go-to, right? And you just think about people who do some of these horrifying, heinous crimes as younger people. And when you look at the different circumstances as to the why, and there literally is no why for him, it was just the next best option. And you just sit here and think, well, I mean, my God, if he, this is his reaction to stress. Living at home as a 24 year old with your mommy and daddy doing everything for you because he's lying about everything, right? What in God's name would he do when he's 40 years old out there holding a job down if he was able to do that? Potentially having a family, you know what I'm saying? Like these normal things that you encounter, what would he do? I mean, it's, you know, I mean, I think he would be one of the headlines you read of person, you know, comes in and wipes out, you know, everybody in a fill in the blank or, you know what I'm saying? Like something of that nature. Um, I mean, he is clearly completely incapable of dealing with anything. Every one of us 
in this courtroom have dealt with bad situations in life. Every one of us have left work one day thinking, man, I really don't want to go home tonight because I did something and I'm going to have to talk about it. Every one of us here has probably walked into work one day thinking, boy, I don't really want to walk into my supervisor's office and got to talk about that. Life is full of inconveniences. Life is full of being uncomfortable. The difference between everyone else in this room and Mr. Halderson is all of us have owned up to that. All of us walked into those rooms, walked into our front door. All of us have address those situations, whether it be comfortable or uncomfortable. And he, he says this so eloquently and, and just absolutely agree with everything he said. I mean, we all deal with this stuff every day, right? So it's like, what would he, I mean, it, I mean, I just, I have so many things to say, I can't spit it out. This guy is not capable of being free at all, right? At all. Um, I mean, that is very much clear. And again, maybe psychologically, it's now interesting to look back. I wish, you know, I wish there was a way that you could really do this when these kind of scenarios happen. Um, of to just study these people, right? In some fashion, and they might have this kind of stuff. But it's like I don't know how that world works, because I think Chandler would be a good case study for why, like, what happened. Like, you know, can we get a brain scan? You know what I'm saying? Like something, uh, just to study this dude to see, like, what in God's name made him just flip like this. So I, I love that they are presenting this information in this way because it's so true and it so desperately needs to be stated. I don't know how you protect the public from someone like that. His willingness to solve the minor inconveniences of life with brutal violence can never be mitigated in our community. And it's true. I mean, it's it's very true. You could never let this out. And, and I'm sorry, but you know, and we'll get to this too and more when the judge speaks. But there, you there is no rehabilitating this, in my opinion. This goes so far over the edge that there's just there's no coming back from this. And how could anyone ever have this on their shoulders to know that they potentially let a monster like this out into the public? And I don't care if it's 20 years later. Okay, now let's listen to some of the things that the defense has to say, and um, I'm going to hold my conversation about what they have to say once the judge says something in regards to their, um, not performance, but how they handled their side of the case during this trial. What I do want to focus on today is just what we're asking for, which we are asking for the possibility of parole. And I want to stress that it is a possibility. It is not a guarantee. And I, I cannot stress that enough. I cannot stress enough how all we are asking for today is for the possibility of this man to show you that he is redeemable. Okay, so there. I will say this. I get they are the defense. It is their job to try and get the best circumstances for their client that they possibly could. Of course, they are going to form a case for, you know, him getting the potential, the possibility, as she said, not the guarantee, for a second chance down the line. Now, there are a couple of things that she will say during this, we're going to listen to one of them, I think, now, uh, that I'm kind of like, I, I don't like the way this is worded, the way it made me feel. Um, so let's go ahead and just proceed. 24. There are a lot of growing up, there's a lot of adulting that he's going to miss out on, that he's going to have to do in the institution that ultimately is going to affect who he becomes in the future. Most of us get the opportunity to do that around our family, with our community, whatever it is. And he's going to have to do that in custody. Okay, so that part right there, I'm like, Eesh. you know, that didn't age well. So, I mean, my first thought is I'm like, well, yeah, he's not going to get that opportunity because he took his family out, right? Uh, now I get he has other members of his family, but that that sympathy card right there, it's it's too soon for that. You know what I'm saying? It's way too soon. Um, no one's going to really be feeling that sorry for him in that way. Again, he had all this opportunity to do this, and he did something horrifying to his family in return for that. Um, I get that there's all this growing up and oh we go through this and it'll shape the person that they are and da 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 and that's fine and dandy if you were thinking that this person might be getting out at some point. And again I get that's the defense. They have to form this argument. They have to go up to bat. I 100% get it. This is one thing I would have worded differently because I feel like there's just a little bit of like to it. So let's continue listening. 
So ultimately, it boils down to what Your Honor believes is an appropriate, fair, and just option, given everything, given all the galleon factors that the state has mentioned and that we have mentioned in our sentencing memorandum. So she sets up this next bit by stating that, which is true, what is appropriate, what's fair, so on and so forth. But now the next part she comes up with, this is another one I'm like, oh, this one, I don't kind of like the way this makes me feel. If Your Honor believes that sentencing is purely punitive, purely an issue of punishment, then the only option is life without parole. But if Your Honor believes that it is a delicate combination of punishment and rehabilitation, redemption, if you will, then there's only one option, and that is the option of life with parole. Okay, so remember how, and these things might still go around, right? But we're like, and mostly I think of this on Facebook, where there would be like a picture, and maybe it would be like a child with cancer, or some kind of like really bad off person in a situation, and it would say something to the point of, you know, if you want to fight cancer and da 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 da, like and share. But if you want to see this person die a horrifying, miserable death, keep scrolling. And it like really made you be like, I, I feel guilty. I didn't know. Like I have a range of feelings that are coming over me. I feel like I have to react to this. You know what I'm saying? And really, all that was was just to get people's like information on a page so that they could then change the name of the page to something else and sell it off. That's a whole other deep dive. But. That statement she just made to the judge completely made me feel that way where I was like, Ugh, don't pivot this onto him of a moral type thing. You know what I'm saying? Um, I just didn't like the way that was framed at all. Uh, and, and again, after hearing the judge explain his thoughts on how he felt the defense handled themselves, it made me appreciate them a little bit more because I was like, oh, wait a minute. Okay, I see where this was going. And again, I'm not a lawyer or anything like that. Um, I felt like in this kind of scenario, in this case, like, what can they say, right? I mean, there's like very little they could do, and they really didn't do that much during the case, which I think was the best strategy, right? Allow the state to tell the story, you know, because they're, the evidence, you can't, the only thing that the defense could have done was re-victimize the victims, essentially, you know what I mean? So, anyways, but I definitely don't agree with the way this is phrased, um, so there's that. So let's continue on. Make a statement. And thank you for doing that. That has changed. Mr. Holderson would like to give a, a statement to your honor. Okay, this is where buckle your damn seatbelts up. Roscoe, buckle up back there. Good God Almighty. Herein lies where we get to see crazy on display. Okay, we're about to listen to what he has to say. And again, this is my whole thing. I'm just like, after all of this heartfelt testimony, after literally hearing a weepy state read the, through the things, the judge has cried at a certain point during this. I don't think we've gotten to that part yet. But, you know, the judge is even, I mean, this is like emotional, right? And so this is what, when his one chance to sit here and talk. Now, remember, he already filed the motion saying he didn't want to show up to this, right? And this is the one thing where they're like, you have to show up, right? Um, this is what he has to say after all this. Your Honor, I want to take this opportunity to state my intent to appeal my convictions. If there are any lawyers listening and willing to take on my appeal, take a moment to please reach out to me. It's not that I do not have feelings. It's that I was warned to not show them due to the scrutiny of this case. Thank you. Thank you. The... I mean, y'all know his defense team wanted to crawl under that table. As I'm watching it, I'm like this. I'm like, the cringe was so horrible. But again, this is what I'm talking about. After all this, and again, it's just psychologically, it's fascinating and baffling. After all this, all he has to do is an advertisement for a lawyer for appeal. I mean, and then to say, it's not that I don't have emotion, it's that I was warned not to show it. And I'm like, oh, honey, we already saw the videos of them. There was nothing there. This is somebody void of a soul, right? <sighs> you know what it reminds me of? Not as, not, I don't want to say comical, but like absurd was the sentencing at the Courtney Bell and, um, uh, 
Christopher McNabb when Christopher got up there and it was like so tone deaf, right? And the only thing he had to say is he wanted to make sure that everybody knew he hadn't done that thing to the female shrink. And I'm like, you cannot make this stuff up. It's like they just beg to be like, I am the type of individual that needs to be locked away forever and here is why. Okay, so now here's where I want to talk about some of the defense stuff and we're going to do it through the lens of what the judge says. And so let's go ahead and listen to him. Now, first of all, I love this judge. He was so mannerly, just kept things moving, very methodical, very organized, uh, just two thumbs up, and that's that. So let's listen to what he has to say. Uh, but I wouldn't be remiss if I did not say that their actions, and I agree with Mr. Brown in this respect, that their actions um, at trial advanced Mr. Halderson's constitutional right to require the state to prove its case and did so in a professional and efficient manner such that um, I find that they served their role in this process admirably. Now that statement right there, now after that he's like kind of crying right here and he'll like blow his nose and he's like, I'm sorry I get very passionate about the justice system and all this. And it kind of made their strategy make more sense to me where I was like, Okay, yeah, they just basically sat back because remember if you watch this, I mean they would ask really random questions It was almost like it was a training session for the girl with the curly hair, I guess um, I, I don't know it just seemed like that as opposed to like a full force, you know, we're coming at it They were not aggressive up there at all. I mean it was just very it, it was kind of weird to watch it Especially for somebody like me who doesn't I don't know any of the ins and outs of law and things of that nature and like different types of tactics and stuff. You know what I'm saying? Uh, other than, you know, I'm sitting here on my sofa. So, um, but hearing the judge say that and seeing him get so passionate and, you know, kind of weepy over that, again, just what an honorable judge. What an honorable judge. What a wonderful courtroom that he runs. So let's keep listening to him. Move on to the points in this proceeding at which I need to be dispassionate. And I need to be dispassionate because as the person sitting in judgment, I have to try and achieve a proper analysis of the sentencing goals based upon the information and evidence put forward and what the legislature has determined to be the appropriate sentences. This is the kind of do that it's almost like if he was lecturing you about something, like you would be okay with it, right? Like he just, he's so well spoken. And like even when he's getting ready to like do what he's getting ready to do, he's just very. You know, here you go. Um, I just, I love listening to him talk. I could, he, this is a courtroom. Like, this guy needs a TV show, right? Because I could just watch him in trial or whatever, a do court all day long, right? I just really admire him. I don't know the victims. I did not know the victims. I know people like them. I'm privileged to say. And I know and can understand the empty space that this crime has left. I like that he honored that and said, you know, even though I didn't know them, I know people like them, you know, I can appreciate this, the gravity of this and whatnot, because I think during a lot of these cases, and this was one of them, where you get to know the victims, right? Um, and, and in this case, we did as best we can through our TV screens or however you watch it on your phone, computer, whatever. Um, and, and so I'm just really glad that he acknowledged this, and I'm glad the way that he treated them and their memory with such respect throughout this trial. It is tragic. It is something which will take decades for some to heal. I hope not that long, but healing may never come for, for some. Another thing when he's speaking is you can just hear, and I think you could hear this in everybody, the, their tone, however you say it, is how bothered they are, right? These are people that do this for a living. Like, you know, he's a judge, they're lawyers, or this. And you can just really get the sense of, oh my God. And it gives me goosebumps right now. Being in the sentencing where you're doing this, like, okay, he's already been found guilty, so we're past that anxiety, right? And we're into this part where truly it's almost like, uh, to me, it almost feels like you can exhale a little bit. But then the, the, the enormity of the sadness and the tragedy just overwhelms the courtroom. It is true that rehabilitation is a factor that must be considered, and Attorney Brown's point is, is well noted. 
that um, I'm not certain that anyone has identified rehabilitative needs, but uh, those may arise over time, depending upon an individual's receptiveness and willingness to participate in self-examination or diagnosis or other steps. Now there's some key things that he said in here. Number one, a, a participant's willingness, uh, someone's willingness to participate, self-awareness, all this stuff. Y'all, these are all things that Chandler has never shown. I mean, up to this, he was saying he didn't want to come to sentencing, right? And this is the kind of stuff that matters. And I'm sure Chandler was like, please, they're not gonna, you know, waste my time. And I mean, obviously, right, you know, but I love that the judge said this because this is what it all comes down to. I remember the defense is just like, you know, oh, well, the rehabilitation and this and that. And it's like, look, your client hasn't even shown a willingness for any of that in this stage of the game, right? Before he even gets to the big house. <sighs> you know, I mean, it's almost like the slap in the face for the court at this point. There is no hope for rehabilitation. The gravity of the offense is as serious as it could be. And I must not overlook, of course, the steps taken to hide the crime. The steps taken which, if one ponders it, uh, certainly makes the crime even worse. If you could say that. Now, one thing about the judge, what he's saying, and I don't think I included it, but you know, he's talking about like, he doesn't want to think about it, right? He's already had to see these pictures. He's already had to get on that road. That's the one thing with this crime that literally when I think about it and then I get the images in my head and again, I mean, I don't know these people, right? I'm just somebody who watched it on TV. So I'm like, God only knows. Think of his girlfriend and Tess and all these people, you know, who the, the body parts left on their farm. And I mean, just the imagery, the things that they has to haunt them at night. I mean, if it bothers me this bad, you know what I'm saying? So, and I think that it bothered the judge and everyone else that had to be, you know, witness to this to help bring justice to the surface. Um, and that's just one of the things with this crime is those imageries, images come to the surface of this and it's not pretty. I mean, it is literally stuff that you only see in some of the worst of the worst horror films. But fortunately their dignity is in all here in these people that remember them, these people that are here today because of them. I appreciated learning more about them and my condolences go to every member of their family. I like that he said this aspect here because he was saying, you know, how Chandler tried to steal their dignity, yet, you know, it's still intact through the memory of the people that knew them and loved them and cared for them. And again, I'm just, I'm really thankful that their story came to the surface because in something as horrifying as this, where like I was talking about those images or what come to your mind, it's good to see that people have preserved their memory as for strangers alike and whatnot. Um, so that that wasn't all that was left behind are these horrifying, you know, thoughts of what took place to them. You know, we were able to learn what decent people they were, what good parents they were, and what wonderful friends they were, and the impact, the good impact that they left here on this plane. It is to Barton Christus credit the foundation Mr. Halderson enjoyed. And it does not explain what happened here. Again, I'm glad he brought this up. And, and he said it in that way, the foundation that he enjoyed because they laid a good foundation for him, right? He had everything at his fingertips. And he just scrawled it away and was completely unappreciative about it to the extent that we're all here. But in all honesty, I must say that as a, as a wiser judge indicated to me once, uh, you should sentence people not because of your anger, if indeed you're fearful of them, and not utilize the same standards for both. I honestly think that's one of the most beautiful judicial quotes I think I've ever heard in my life. And I've really started changing the lens that I look through stuff because y'all know me here. I'm going to sit here and rip on these criminals and do all this kind of stuff, whatever, right? Um, but then in all seriousness, when it comes to things of, you know, okay, look, rehabilitation or not, 
this, that, and the other. And there's some crimes, because and the judge did say this too, where he's like, you know, there's cases where, and he's like, and I know the victims don't want to hear it, but there is a sense of maybe this person could be rehabilitated, right? Um, not specifically about Chandler, but just in general. And, but looking at it through the lens of, you know, not my anger, but my fear of the person, my fear of them in the future, that kind of thing. And I mean, when you do that, I mean, number one, it's very hard not to look through the lens of anger with something like this, right? But then when you look through it, of how afraid am I, am I of this person? And you look at all these things they've talked about, of the absolute senselessness of this. And I mean, it's a no brainer, right? This person absolutely needs to be put under the jail. I cannot conceive of a way to fulfill my duty to protect the public that I serve were I to perceive that at some point in time an individual who committed these crimes should be released back into that public. I cannot grant to Mr. Halderson the generosity of spirit and empathy that his grandmother has for him. That part was also so powerful, you know, to say, I can't do the same that his grandmother has granted for him. And, you know, I can't, the community I serve, there's no way. And I mean, I agree with him. There's absolutely no way. Imagine going uh, going to sleep at night knowing that you had given this man the possibility for parole, right? I mean, this just, mm -mm. maybe he can become a productive citizen incarcerated, right? There's plenty of things he can be doing in there. We see people do this all the time that probably should stand a better chance of getting released, right? That are still being kept in there for doing something horrible, but not as horrible, right? His kind of thing right here, I'm like, how do you, I mean, again, there's just, what you know i'm absolutely not you know absolutely not so i mean i just i so agree with the judge on this i cannot say to the community here in this room or at large in this county that mr halderson should have the ability to be reviewed and considered for release back into our community at any point despite his young age at this point in his life. And again, I'll go back to this on that note, doing the parole thing, now mind you, parole could be how many years down the road, but here's the thing, his family members, Mitchell, Mitchell's wife, all these people, the friends, family, all this, they're gonna all continue on and try and heal and go on with life. To have to sit here and constantly then be like, in 20 years, oh, we have to go to a parole hearing for this, you know, and speak against it and all this, I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, I think he's really doing the surviving victims a favor, is what I'm getting at. I have to, for this sentence, ensure that the only time Mr. Halderson comes back into the community is to have the privilege of a burial that he denied his parents. Again, such beautifully spoken words and so true. I mean, literally, he's going to get something at the end of his life, whenever that is, that he didn't even give his parents, right? And I just, oh my God, this judge just, he is so well spoken. I just love the way he delivers his messages. Evidence. So uh, to make this quite simple, I will impose maximum terms concurrent to each other and concurrent to counts one and five on each of the other counts within the information of which the verdict convicted Mr. Halderson. I do believe that by imposing the maximum, I'm recognizing the severity of those individual acts, but there is a life sentence here, so making them consecutive is, does not undermine the gravity of that given the maximum penalty involved. So there you have it. He get you know he ain't getting out right. No parole, none of this stuff or whatever. And I like that the judge kind of clarified his reasoning and doing the concurrent as opposed to consecutive, um, and, and making sure that it was noted like that's not to undermine things in the situation, right? Um, so I think a lot of us could, but you never know. I was going to say, I think a lot of us could have guessed where this was going to go on the sentencing. Again, we all knew it was going to be a life sentence, uh, but you just never really know which way it's going to go, right? You never know. Um, and, and again, my heart goes out to the victims in this case. I definitely think that he is where he belongs. Uh, I do not think he should ever walk free ever again. It's just, he's absolutely shown absolutely no signs of ever being the type of person who should 
be free to deal with the general public and harm the general public because I 100% think he would. And I think there's other people in this case that are very lucky. Um, his girlfriend's uh, mother and her partner, they are alive because I do think that he would have done the same thing to them eventually, uh, especially they moved in with them. I mean, there's no telling what this guy is capable of. I mean, we see what we see what he's capable of, right? But he's capable of much more, is what I should say. So, anyways, I want to know your thoughts. You know, and again, watch the whole thing if you want to. I just picked out parts and pieces of it that really stuck out to kind of you know start a conversation or whatever. Uh, but definitely watch the whole thing. Check it out. Come back to the damn sofa. Let me know what you think. And uh, that's it. Thank you to everybody who makes the sofa squad possible. It wouldn't be here without you. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, again, drop comments and love for the victims in this case down in the comment section and i hope everybody's doing well out there and until we gather around the sofa with uh mr roscoe where is he uh right there he's right there i'll see you soon